This is Aaron Talk on KPOO 89.5 FM in San Francisco. This is Arab Talk with Jess and Jamal. I'm Jess Van Dam. And I'm Jamal Dejani. Jamal, there has been a significant and deepening escalation of the genocide and war in Gaza, as well as the greater Middle East. We're going to be talking about a rather dramatic series of developments, including the assassination of the top political head of Hamas, Ismail Haniya. He was assassinated by Israel in the capital of Iran, in Tehran, sending shockwaves throughout the region. In addition, Israel, uh, within a short period of time prior to that, ass- assassinated a major military commander, Fuad Shukar, in Beirut. And then Israel announced uh, just within the last 24 hours they confirmed the death of Mohammed Deif, who was a senior military commander in the Hamas military wing. These developments have shaken the Middle East, Jamal. Uh, we are on the precipice of a major escalation in war in the region with, with in, Be- in Beirut, in Lebanon, in Iran, maybe in Yemen too. And all the while, while these escalations are occurring, Israel fired a rocket into a tent killing 18 Palestinians, including women and children, who were already internally displaced. So, Jamal, we're facing some grave developments. Uh, We're going to be talking about all those things today, including it appears that Benjamin Netanyahu, who appears to have lied to Joe Biden about the so-called peace deal, which was, as we've been saying, a big joke, but he apparently fooled Joe Biden again, is dragging the U.S. into yet another regional war. We're going to continue to talk about the assassinations of, uh, of uh, Ismail Haniya and Fouad uh, Shukar. And, you know, the, re- the retaliation is imminent, so we have to talk about the implications globally. But before we get to all that, we're going to really uh, we're going to take a look at a great interview you did with Tali Shapiro. She's an Israeli BDS activist and expert on sexu- sexual and gender-based violence. She's going to discuss the systematic abuse and rape of Palestinian political prisoners in Israeli jails, Jamal, something we've been talking about a long time. There was a recent uh, report of a gang rape and sodomization of a Palestinian prisoner in one of Israel's notorious uh, torture facilities. It's a very disturbing interview. It's very disturbing considering that you have Israeli uh, lawmakers who justify this, and then you have... uh, Israelis who storm the uh, prison where these uh, soldiers were held at, uh, trying to free them and uh, praising them as uh, heroes. Uh, let's watch the interview with Tali Shapiro. Israeli military police arrested nine reservists, including a major, the commander of Force 100, for gang raping and sodomizing a Palestinian prisoner at Israel's notorious Deutemen military and torture facility. The prisoner suffered severe uh, anal trauma, fractured ribs, and a ruptured bowel, necessitating immediate surgery. One of the nine Israeli soldiers arrested has been released without charge. Deliberations about the other eight are continuing. Allegations of abuse by Israeli soldiers against Palestinian detainees at the Deutemen were reported in May. An anonymous Israeli whistleblower who worked at the facility in the Negev Desert reported gruesome details of abuse, rape, torture, and mistreatment of Palestinians. In June, a three-month investigation by the New York Times uncovered harrowing details of the conditions endured by the roughly 4,000 Palestinian detainees, including horrific accounts of rape. In response to the arrest, Pro-rapist Israeli protesters, including extremist Knesset members, stormed the military base and held demonstrations condemning the arrest of the rapist soldiers and describing them as heroes. Joining us to discuss this is Tali Shapiro. Tali is a longtime BDS activist and proponent of community accountability and restorative justice, justice models, in particular models detailing with issues of sexual and gender violence, which he has authored, employed, and advised on, and adapted for different communities. Welcome to Arab Talk, Tali. Thank you, Jamal. It's nice to be here. 
Although this is the first time Israel has charged soldiers with the abuse of Palestinian detainees, the United Nations Agency for Palestinian Refugees, UNRWA, said it received reports of mass ill-treatment of Palestinians uh, taken captive from Gaza by Israeli forces, including detainees being urinated on and made to act like animals and children being attacked by dogs. How widespread is the abuse of Palestinian prisoners in Israeli prisons? And can you elaborate on the type and cruelty of the abuse after and before October 7? Yeah, um, I think uh, it's pretty safe to say that to a certain extent, all Palestinian uh, detainees, uh, or rather hostages, are uh, suffer so- some form of sexual abuse. Um, already from early October, we, we've been seeing videos, and then later on the, the army published its own pictures of, um, of hostages who were, who were stripped naked, uh, out, outside in the street or outside in some ditch. Um, and that in and of itself already is sexual violence. And it's it's a personal sexual violence. It's a collective personal violence. The, the fact that it's everybody next to everybody, um, it, that in and of itself is, is, the, is another layer of degradation, of humiliation. And, um, and it's hard to tell how widespread sexual violence is, but uh, just seeing that, and ha- and there are sometimes fifty, a hundred people in the same photo, right? Then, then I would as- I would assume that we're talking about uh, the whopping majority, uh, if not all the all the hostages go through a certain. Uh, aspect of sexual violence, the, beginning with forced nudity. Also, we know that uh, with with uh, the Israeli uh, police and prison services, when you go in and out of different um, uh, facilities, then you go through a strip search. And and we also know from from past experiences uh, of of many many years, decades, that uh, that strip searches are 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 used often to to torment and and humiliate. So. Uh, from before October seven, way before October seven, and and definitely after, it seems to be ex- extremely pervasive. And I, I would, my assumption is that everybody at least goes through forced nudity, and that that is just the tip of the iceberg. Obviously, because once they're in facilities, although we we do have also very harsh accounts of harsh, horrific accounts of uh, of sexual violence. For example, uh, we we had uh, a testimony from. Uh, a Red Crescent worker who was taken hostage from the ambulance while moving patients, and they were they were taken into an abandoned building that had debris in it uh, and the glass on the floor, and they were made to take off their clothes and sit on the glass. Uh, this is extreme, extreme sexual violence. You've been, uh, I think, alternating between. I mean, we use the term. Uh, some people use the. Uh, detainees and then prisoners and then you've been using hostages and then Israel likes to use that they are all Hamas uh, members I mean how do you distinguish I mean I mean we've seen children we've seen women but how do you distinguish whether the uh, the Palestinians who get transferred by Israel to to the Negev whether they are just ordinary people you talk about an ambulance uh, worker or whether they are members of Hamas, or they're just like families, and they're all put together and tortured together? Is that is that the case? It, it would seem so. Uh, it's hard, again, it's hard to tell what's going on inside. Um, Israel, obviously, is not a, a uh, reliable narrator, So, but Israel claims that there are particular places where it keeps the what they like to call the nukhbas, which is like this, uh, this word they like to use, um, and which would be, you know, uh, Hamas elite fighters, right? So they say that that's where they keep them, but they, but also we, we know for a fact that, that people in those designated places that came out were, you know, just just normal civilians, uh, normal, I don't know, you know, just civilians. And um, so so in that sense, we, 
I highly doubt there is differentiation because what we're seeing is a lot of people coming out who who are children and elders and I don't know, uh, you know, again, uh, Red Crescent workers, teachers, bakers, and and they're all giving the same testimony. So what's the difference? And I don't think that Israel uh, uh, differentiates. And I can tell you that specifically in Sedat Eman, where um, the Ministry of Health, the Israeli Ministry of Health, uh, they issued a written document, uh, which I've uh, I've actually written about extensively, um, where they explain what the the protocols should be, in in very um, laundered language, uh, for, uh, specifically for healthcare workers. Um, but the part of it, part of what is in this document, is that uh, people in Sdeteman are considered, um, I already forget the terminology, but uh, like uh, an illegal uh, fighters, something like this, right? Now, we we know that elders came out of that institution. We, we know that, you know, that children were in, interned in that institution. And in fact, there are regulations in that document about children. So how are they fighters? And we know that children as young as 14, right? And it's it just... I don't think that Israel can be trusted. I think, though, that we can, uh, be, because the situation is, is so obscured, uh, we can definitely glean from their documents and from their testimonies in when we compare and contrast to, to testimonies of the victims. So, you know, Palestinian society and, of course, Israeli society, but you know that, uh, for example, Palestinian women and and minors, children who have been physically and sexually abused, in most cases they don't talk about it, and because of the trauma, shame, and stigma associated with it, meaning with sexual abuse and rape. Uh, have you had the opportunity to talk to some of the women, and who would privately share their horrific stories? So uh, I would say, and it's important to note that all my information is not from people I spoke with. I did not speak to a single victim. What all the information that I have, and I've been collecting since the October 9th, I believe, uh, videos started coming out of, of soldiers who themselves filmed uh, naked Palestinian men, um, it, t- zip tied, and and them beating them and torturing them. Uh, so, so this is, it's, it's all public information. Rather, I did not speak to any of the victims. I will say this prior to October 7, men did not speak of sexual abuse. I did speak to several who were victims of sexual abuse, who testified about themselves to me and about others. Um, but publicly they wouldn't speak about it. And when I spoke to one of the organizations about this issue, this, this phenomena exists. We need to do something about it. We need to encourage men to speak out. Um, everybody in the room, uh, crossed their legs uncomfortably. So clearly there, there was an issue about men speaking out. So, but prior to, to October 7th, women did speak out. Women did in fact speak out. And we did have testimonies from, uh, from different organizations about the children uh, so, so they were talking to somebody, obviously, and children more than adults, even though I definitely include adults in this category, a lot of them can tell you what happened to them, but they don't know to say, um, I was raped, I was sexually assaulted. They don't know the categories of it. Uh, but, but we know, and we also, from experience, I've been arrested many, many times by, by the army and, and there, there are elements of, of, uh, sexual abuse within, within those things. Um, but generally speaking, women did. Di- if anyone spoke out, it was the women. Mm. After so October 7th, interestingly enough, uh, men are speaking out. Um, I, I've seen several women testify to the camera, but men are speaking out with their faces, with their natural voices, uh, directly to the camera. In the moment that they come out right there, they, they come out. Um, basically, the army dumps them somewhere in Gaza uh, when we're talking about the 
the the hostages from Gaza. They are dumped somewhere there and and then forced to run uh, while being shot at. The many cases of testimonies like that, and uh, the uh, emergency services they find them somewhere and they take them to the hospital and in the hospital. So really immediately upon release in the hospital, there are um, journalists who are interviewing them, right? And and they will they. In those initial interviews, they will often indicate something horrible that happens in 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 very little detail, and then often there's follow up interviews, or maybe you know I will recognize some of these details when I'm reading an NGO report uh, about a week later, and I know exactly who that person is, and I will go back and compare and contrast, you know, and and then they give a lot more detail. Um, and again, like most victims, that you. They don't categorize. They don't say I've been raped. Although there are victims who will use the word of the sub, you know. But but most of them do not say uh, rape or sexual assault or categorize it. But rather just tell us what had happened to them. And of course, the the, the stories of extreme abuse often um, different um, objects used to and put in the body and and so and so forth. So. Well, this is a case actually of, uh, of extreme abuse because, as you know, this is not the first report of Israeli jailers raping Palestinian prisoners at the Tiemen. The New York Times documented an allegation of rape from a senior nurse who said two soldiers lifted him up and pressed his rectum against a metal stick fixed to the ground. UNRWA reported one detainee died after anal rape with an electric stick. But then we see Knesset lawmakers are now debating whether rape is acceptable or when rape is acceptable. What kind of perverse argument is this? I mean, I, I, how, how does the Israeli society view this? So uh, th to be extremely specific about that, uh, there, there was a, a particular debate happening in a particular committee, which wasn't a debate. What happened in that committee was that uh, one of the uh, uh, lawmakers uh, talked in, in kind of vague terms about, about uh, the soldiers who have now been arrested. And he says that I'm going to, I'm, I'm calling on everybody to, to, um, strike from voting, so a kind of vote strike, uh, until this thing is the uh, you know is resolved, and then uh, Knesset member, Palestinian Knesset member Ahmed Tribi, he uh, vocalized a provocative rhetorical question: Is it uh, legitimate to in insert sticks into a person's rectum? These were his exact words. To which the other parliament member uh, answered. Yes. So uh, this, you know, um, and I think as as horrific as that answer was, I think more horrific actually, and, and this wasn't questioned really, was that the entire room, it was an entire boardroom filled with people. Uh, and it's not just around the table where the the uh, parliament members sit, but also it's full of journalists and their aides and, and, and tons of people sit in this room and nobody protests this ex except for Ahmed Tibi. So this wasn't a debate. It was simply consensus. Uh, how do Israelis see this? I think, so what's interesting about this um, is really that what is discussed now is how dare they arrest soldiers for anything really, right? And, and the fact that we're talking about a gang rape um, is, is completely secondary to the issue. And I think that tells you a lot about the dehumanization and also, you know, any statement about rape at all. Uh, because it, it used to be that Israelis would deny that torture happens in Israeli prisons. Uh, and now it's like, it's just a secondary issue. We don't even bother denying it. And, and I think that's... Um, well, uh, the, the soldiers have been, uh, I mean, in a, in a crazy way, documenting their own actions, uh, uh, posting them on Instagram and Facebook, uh, bragging about soldiers uh, dressing up in women's uh, lingerie. Uh, you know, I mean, this, this has become like a fad. Uh, many of these soldiers are posting this 
others showing their abuse of uh, uh, Palestinian uh, prisoners, uh, taking photos with them while riding uh, in in the in the in the I guess the jeep or something like this with them blindfolded and naked. It's kind of reminiscent of uh, you know because people talk about Guantanamo, but it's really more like Abu Ghraib. It's just kind of reminiscent of of this that there is now like this whole movement of showing off uh, how many bad ways can you torment and beat up Palestinians and and rape them. So this is again like is is the Israeli society accepting this? Well, I mean, it, this is uniquely, uniquely an Israeli Instagram, TikTok trend. Uh, let's take a selfie with uh, with a prisoner, you know, who who is being mistreated because it, let's talk about the blindfold, that simple act of blindfolding a prisoner. You know, I'm not talking about uh, the zip ties because this is this is a common practice uh, by police, not even armies everywhere. Uh, I think it should be con contested, but but let's talk about the blindfolds because blindfolds uh, when the army or border patrol arrest Palestinians in the West Bank, in Gaza, this is protocol. Blindfolding a prisoner is protocol. You're supposed to do it. And nobody discusses the fact that blindfolding a prisoner is sensory deprivation. And uh, the site is one of our most, if not the most dominant um, sense that we have. So obviously this is this is completely not only acceptable but policy and beyond that we have the issue of um of this is a trend right so here here's somebody being tortured suffering sensory deprivation and other forms of torture that are happening in the video and then we have, have the unique uh, uniquely israeli uh, social media trends of uh, uh chewing on absent uh, exiled and killed women's underwear which is so extreme and so vile. And and the fact that, here's the thing, as an Israeli, I will say this. Um, I don't um, strike up conversations with strangers on the train because I know that my opinions, my support of Palestinian liberation is so far off the charts that anyone I speak to is going to be, you know, most probably dangerous to me and a fascist in general you know so i, I don't have these conversations so th this is completely normalized and my assumption before october 7 is that everybody's genocidal uh and i've been i've been actually advocating this i'm uh, i'm the proud owner of uh, a url israelgenocide.com i've been advocating the use of the terminology of genocide i've been looking at colonialism settler colonialism and how it's genocide and so on and so forth um so to me, the Israeli society has been primed to commit these crimes. Uh, did I expect sexual crimes and, and such an outward pride in them? Did I figure maybe they'd be a little bit smarter about hiding what they do? Here we are, you know, and this, this is definitely unique in the field of, uh, of uh, genocide studies, genocide, uh, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it is what it is. <laughs> One of the early, uh, I guess, uh, discussion about what happened on October 7th was uh, both Israeli media and, and in the United States, uh, uh, husbandists uh, were uh, marketing the idea that um, uh, Palestinians committed rape uh, on October 7th. And there were also Israel supporters kept circulating lies along with the burned and decapitated babies that never existed. Many of these stories were debunked by um, um, Electronic Intifada and, uh, and Mondawis and, and others, but yet they still keep talking about it. Talk about the hypocrisy and now, you know, we know for sure that multiple verified accounts of, of the rape of Palestinians, including people who worked at these facilities who testified that this was happening. Talk about the hypocrisy and how these cases are handled. I, th I think what's, uh, pardon the use of the word, interesting about this particular case is what what we see is, is uh, these two things are are not separable. So what, 
what we can what we are looking at really and and i want to be very um very clear and very careful about the way i word um any sexual violence that was committed against israelis the we do not have a single account of rape we have one woman who came forward and talked about uh prolonged sexual abuse and uh, and the forced sexual act um so but but none of these cases legally speaking are rape um and 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 she's the only case that actually came forward as as far as we can tell and um and definitely the the whole idea of mass rape has been debunked completely um and i i've been a part of of looking at these cases and then just, and you do when you look at them and you you start to understand that this is propaganda. And so why are these two cases interconnected in, in, in that sense? Again, pardon me, interesting is because what we're actually looking at is a case of a hoax, and I do not use this word lightly, um, of atrocity porn, uh, side by side by a case of actual mass sexual violence and rape uh, in a genocidal context. And the, what, what we're seeing Israel do is invoke uh, rape in, in like the whole mass rape idea in ways that are extremely, um, they're irresponsible, right? And also the way they do it is that every time Israel gets into, into a propaganda bind, right, because, of, because the, all of a sudden something gets into the news, Right. Oh, they bombed the uh, uh, central food kitchen, right? And that got a lot of uh, coverage and a lot of news and some condemnation even. Then, it, once this happened, boom! Again, the rape case is resurrected, right? And it's a over and over. It's the same stories by the same debunked um, sources, and and just that every about every week Israel will bring it up in a new form in a different way and then in a different uh, context or a different media just so that it can basically keep on committing genocide committing mass I think at this point we can call it also mass rape because there's enough uh, testimony that we can see that this is happening massively um, and when we, when we when we look at how Again, atrocity porn, right? The 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 unverified hysterical narrative that it paints with um, with really uh, these stories that are are so grotesque, but have absolutely no evidence to so. So they include the severing of heads, multiple heads, and the severing of genitalia and body parts and all kinds of gruesome details. But there is not a single severed head that was ever found on the scene right for example so that so this disputes that particular account of i first of all she was an ear witness and then there were severed heads and the, you know the, the whole thing just didn't you know it, it falls apart upon uh scrutiny and then all of it uh what i've seen i've been um for the past 10 months i've been translating interviews with soldiers or, or TikToks that soldiers have, have uh, themselves published. And a lot of them cite the rape, right? They, oh, they, they murdered our children. They raped our women. They, you know, they talk, a lot of them talk like this. So I know that Israeli society believes that this is true. While in fact, you know, while some cases of sexual abuse might have happened, it's really hard to tell still despite you know the different reports coming in because the details are just not verified and i've read them all i've read them all um it's really hard to verify you know anything really so despite this israelis across the board left to right believe that mass sexual violence has occurred hmm. The International Criminal Court, the ICC, will only intervene when national legal systems are unwilling or unable to prosecute individuals for the most serious crimes of international concern, such as genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. This 
uh, principle is grounded in the idea that states have the primary responsibility to exercise jurisdiction over these crimes. So legal experts say that the main motivation for Israel, for example, in the recent case in detaining uh, the soldiers, uh, the nine soldiers, is to thwart the ICC arrest warrants for Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Defense Minister Yoav Gallant. Is this the case? Is this the case of Israel putting a pretense that it has a legal process to uh, punish its soldiers who violate uh, human rights and then uh, has a revolving door and lets them out uh, a couple of days later. So actually, I will say that I disagree with that assessment. I, I, it's not a hill I'm going to die on and it's not an argument I'm going to have, but I disagree with this assessment, particularly in this case. Israel did um, say, the, the, the attorney general did, uh, general did say that she was going to prosecute uh, or at least uh, investigate uh, the heritage minister uh, because uh, he said something about nuking uh, <laughs> uh, Gaza, you know, and this this was months ago, and this was obviously in response to the ICJ. Um, nothing, by the way, materialized of this. So, um, so yeah, that was Israel, like I think, putting on a, a bit of a show, and definitely the um, the courts here understand themselves as shields for soldiers and for leaders who might be prosecuted in the future. They say this, they use the word shield. Um, this particular case, I actually don't think that's what's happening. What I think happened, so what we know is that the, the, this is the, a different attorney general, this is the military attorney general. She received videos from the incident of the gang rape. Now, if once she receives such, um, you know, cutting evidence, she is obligated to investigate. Otherwise, she will be legally liable for a whitewash, right? Which is actually worse because that means it's systemized. So uh, she herself on a personal level, but also an institutional level, probably couldn't afford to ignore this particular case. However, already one of the main suspects has been released. And this morning... I personally translated an interview with him where he says that the police treated him so nicely. And while they were, I'm quoting him he, um, or paraphrasing, but he, while they were not allowed to say it, you could see in their eyes and in this gesture where they put their hands on their hearts that they, they were uh, supportive of, of the soldiers, the suspects of gang rape. And, uh, and they, uh, there was even a day when uh, some of them were applauding them and, uh, so, and, and saying thank you. Right. So clearly we're not looking at, uh, you know, an, an, an investigation that is capable of actually um, getting justice. I don't know how you get justice for such a such a violent crime, but but uh, for for any attempt to get justice, that's not what we're looking at. Now, additionally, I will add and this is just a this is a technical issue. And so, yes, if if national courts prosecute for equivalent crimes such as genocide the crime of extermination and that's what we're looking at in the ICC in particular we're looking at the crime of extermination for example and and also they would have to hold to account the those particular suspects so Benjamin Netanyahu and uh, Yoav Gallant they would have to hold them uh they would have to hold them to trial so so holding a few reservists um you know, for, for a particular one single incident of, of rape, it still doesn't preclude the intervention of the international courts. Uh, one final question. I want to get your opinion about uh, Netanyahu's trip to the United States and all the media uh, that he received, uh, I would say conflicting media. On one hand, people in Tel Aviv and in Israel Many of them uh, demonstrate against Netanyahu. I don't think that he's that popular. Then he comes to Congress and he uh, has like something like 60 plus standing ovations when you have thousands of people demonstrating outside and calling him a war criminal. How does that play in the Israeli media? Um, to be honest, I didn't follow on that particular case. I can tell you that we, 
recent polls have actually shown that Netanyahu would win uh, in in the elections. So we know that he's popular enough, apparently, not by a big margin, but still. Um, and yet there are these protests. Um, they don't care about the rape, by the way. And, and then there's also the details of what happened in Congress. So uh, I don't remember how many, but many, many actually boycotted the speech. However, Congress was full to the brim with people. So clearly people were brought in to do the bidding of, you know, seal clapping. Um, how is this perceived in Israeli media? I think Israelis are actually much more critical, much, much more critical of Netanyahu. He's not a beloved figure. Um, he was never beloved. There was a bit of a cultish following. They would call him BB the king. Um, and, and he would get voted for over and over again because of kind of a lack of uh, really any attempts, I think, to to engage in, in politics, even around voting. Um, I don't think the Israeli public is very politically engaged. Um but generally speaking, he gets a lot of flack for a lot of things. It's like, oh, you're, you know, you're going to America to get applause. Uh, you know, you say you're such a top diplomat, but then they complain about things that also are are often misinterpretations of the reality of the situation. So really, that's one of the reasons I don't really follow Israeli media on these kinds of things, because more often than not, what you get is misinterpretations of foreign affairs um, and, and this kind of blind spot that Israel has about like, oh, everybody's anti-Semitic and everybody's against us. There's a real love-hate relationship with Biden. They they think uh, a whopping majority think that they, he's against Israel for some reason, which is fascinating, right? A man who um, professes repeatedly his own Zionism. Uh, so it's, it's hard to comment on, really. I just can say that um, Israeli media and Israeli, the Israeli public like, is much, much more um, critical of Netanyahu than the the international media. And the United States, for sure. Well, Tali, sure. this, this, uh, it's a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for coming uh, on Thank Arab you. Talk. Thank you. It's been up to talking to you, too. That's the voice in the face of Tali Shapiro. She's an Israeli BDS act. Uh, activist and expert on the torture and sexual-based violence uh, against Palestinian prisoners, political prisoners in Israeli jails. It's an extremely disturbing interview, Jamal, and what Tali reports is difficult. But at the same time, you know, Palestinian political prisoners, both men, women, and children, have been tortured and sexually abused and assaulted for decades and decades, Jamal. So what Tali is basically describing is a pattern of and a practice of torture and abuse that we've been talking about for a long time. She's just highlighting the latest development, which is especially gruesome. That's right. And this was the biggest story. And of course, it's not carried that much uh, in Western media. And, and now we have the biggest distraction of all. And the, the timing of it is the assassination uh, conducted both in uh, the Lebanese capital Beirut and in the Iranian capital Tehran. And now the story focuses on this. And we are now, and I'm saying this because by the time we finish the show, we, the United States might very well might be dragged in. I mean, I don't know if American recruits sign up to go to fight <laughs> on behalf of Israel, uh, but that's the case here. And Netanyahu is uh, risking regional war for his own political survival. Uh, and as you've mentioned, uh, supposedly there was a phone call between President Biden and Netanyahu where he told him, stop BS me. BS me uh, and, uh, and basically kind of don't push your luck. But he has allowed him to push his luck all along oh. by supplying him weapons. And now when he is in trouble, because from what I've been monitoring, both Iranian media, Lebanese media, Hezbollah, the speech by Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah, they've been saying, we're not going to let this go. You have attacked our capital. You have, especially for Tehran, it's a matter of honor. Uh, Ismail Haniyeh, who is the political leader for Hamas, was a guest 
to for the inauguration of the new president, and then you go and assassinate him uh, in Iranian soil, and we are going to to respond. And it is expected this this, this retaliation is going to happen any minute as we right. are talking. And meanwhile, uh, the United States has sent more than 35 frigates into the Mediterranean, uh, aircraft carrier, all on behest on the behest on behalf of Israel to defend it because, well, frankly, we don't know what type of response going to be whether it's going to be missiles, and that's why the U.S. is uh, well basically trying to protect it. But I tell you one thing, Hezbollah this morning was toying with Israel, meaning, when I say toying, because Hezbollah has uh, better weapons than Hamas, and was lobbying Katyusha rockets. Katyusha right. rockets, that's like uh, the low end, that's what Hamas uses. And right. so the Iron Dome was activated. And what goes in my mind is that they're testing the Iron Dome capabilities. They're also exhausting the Iron Dome. So if they maintain this, and then the Israelis are going to start crying for help, and they want more missiles and more bombs and so forth. But then later on, if both Hezbollah and Iran and the Houthis overwhelm them with thousands of rockets, it's going to be a whole different story. Well, I think that's exactly right, Jamal. And I want to talk about briefly just like the political dynamics as well as the military dynamics right now. Politically, this is yet another slap in the face of Benjamin Netanyahu in the face of Joe Biden. When Netanyahu came to the United States for his joint message to Congress, you saw all these press releases, you know, same ones we've heard from Biden and from Harris, by the way, were close to a deal. They're being tough with Netanyahu. They're telling him to close the deal. He's got no time left. Netanyahu plays along with it. He he basically gives them a sucker punch. You know, he says, sure, sure. And then as soon as he gets back to Tel Aviv, he launches these two assassinations, which are grave escalations, Jamal. And at a time, and this is really important, when Biden is weakened because he's no longer the Democratic nominee. And the national consensus of the United States and the mainstream media is focused on Biden, is focused on Trump, Biden, and Harris. No one is paying attention in the mainstream media to what's happening in Palestine, Beirut, or in Tehran. Really, it's very little press, which is shocking to you and me, because literally this could be the greatest escalation in the war since the 80s, maybe even, you know, the in the 2000s. When the uh, when Hezbollah kicked Israel out of uh, southern Lebanon, I think we're we're in store for a major escalation. Unfortunately, Palestinians are going to pay the price, Jamal, because the genocide in Gaza and the starvation of Palestinians in Gaza continues full steam ahead. So I I, I feel like we're entering a new phase right now, which is going to be very very traumatic for everybody. Well, the thing is also, uh, the interesting part about this phase is now we hear uh, all uh, U.S. Uh, congressmen and senators and so forth, some of them are egging the United States to get involved, to send uh, um, bunker busters to, to bomb, uh, I mean, to send to bomb Iran with bunker busters. Others are saying, let's go back to diplomacy. They always wait after Israel commit, co commits a heinous crime. <laughs> and then later on said, let's sit down. Let's sit down and, and talk. talk about it. Let's sit down There's... and talk about it. I mean, this, the killing, Haniyeh's killing in Tehran, puts Iran in a very embarrassing position. And, and that's, that's why I say the retaliation is imminent. Because, you know, the strike by a foreign country, number one, which is Israel, openly violated Iran's sovereignty at the time when the regime was preparing to celebrate the appointment of a new president. And the Hamas chief was among international dignitaries invited to the inauguration. So if you invite, uh, imagine if the United States, you know, in the, in the next presidential inauguration, um, you know, ambassadors, foreign ambassadors and so forth attend, and then one of them gets assassinated in Washington, D.C., 
by a foreign country. What would be the reaction? I mean, would what be, would yeah, be the reaction by the United States? Of course. And that's and then so they're asking Iran to kind of like sit it out and say, hey, hey, it is, uh, wait, wait a minute, just, let's go back to negotiations. Let's not escalate. Meanwhile, the Mediterranean is full with with the U.S. naval ships. Just yes, this is this is like. A staging area for a war. I don't know how they're gonna de-escalate it. And as I said, no, there's no. We don't know exactly how and when uh, Iran will respond, but uh, it it could be any minute. Like I said, right. we will. We might finish the show, and uh, it's gonna be the show is gonna be about the, the the new war or the new regional war. But Iran, in in from what I've been reading. They're just saying we have to respond, and if they respond, of course, Hezbollah is going to respond, and and so forth. And that's what Benjamin Netanyahu wants from day one, from day one, going all the way back to attack I- Iran on behalf of Israel because of uh, its nuclear program. So it's like a full circle. He takes advantage of this opportunity now to drag. This is something that, going back all the way. Um, you know, to President Obama trying to drag him into attacking Iran, to even Trump and so forth, and now Biden, and now he wants to put the United States in a position to attack uh, Iran and on beh- on behalf of Israel. Well, I think that's exactly right, Jamal. Let's let let's remind our listeners what the strategic aims of Benjamin Netanyahu are. Number one, he wants to bomb Iran. Because he wants to uh, do a military uh, action that will take out the the nuclear program that they have. He's been screaming about that forever. So he's using this as a pretext to invite the Iranians to do something so that he can go into Iran and and destroy their nuclear uh, their nuclear project. Second, he's been uh, screaming at the top of his lungs that he has to take out Hezbollah and take Beirut and Lebanon, as they say, Jamal, very racistly, back to the Stone Age. And that's part of their military objective. And if Hezbollah responds, they may use this as an opportunity to uh, engage in a full-scale war again in, in, in Lebanon, in the south, and, and perhaps even in Beirut. And then the third front, Jamal, is with uh, obviously is with Hamas in Gaza. And they will use this as a pretext even though the genocide right now is catastrophic, Palestinians are dying at an alarming rate. You know, estimates of over 100,000 now, when you look at the under-reporting of the deaths in Gaza and the mass starvation and, and the ongoing bombings that are going on, as well as what's happening in the West Bank, Netanyahu will use this chaos, especially during the U.S. Uh, presidential election cycle, uh, when everybody's distracted, he may use this as an opportunity to, quote, finish the job, which in his mind is, you know, extending the genocide in Gaza, building new settlements in the West Bank and taking over as much Jerusalem as possible. This is the big picture that we're facing, Jamal, right now. And Netanyahu, because of his belligerence and because of his uh, actions, are putting the entire world in an even more precarious situation. Uh, just as a small side note, you know that uh, Turkey's President Erdogan said that he would even invade Israel himself in a, in a message uh, that he delivered. So, you know, this is a very uh, precarious situation. And I think by the time our story airs, you know, we could be in the middle of uh, uh, regional war. We, yeah. And, and uh, one thing I forgot to mention, that Iran's new president, Masoud uh, Bezikchan, uh, was touted as a leader who could pivot Iran towards the West because right. people look at him as progressive. So whenever Netanyahu feels that you know there is a rapprochement between the United States and Iran, and that was the case when um, basically the agreement that came over the nuclear, um, um, you know, uh, nu- Iran's nuclear uh, program. Now uh, they try to stir something. He he stirs something up to kind of like kills that that any hopes of peace between the United States and Iran, right. and of course right. any hopes of peace between um, you know or any 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 kind of agreement to reach a ceasefire because 
the ceasefire that he was talking about, which, by the way, one of his negotiators has had has quit and accused him of just basically, you know, lying, lying, lying about it, because he knows that if you have a ceasefire, which means because that's what Hezbollah also said, if you have a ceasefire, Hezbollah will honor the ceasefire and they'll stop, and everything will go back hopefully to to normal. So, so, the, so the closer they get to a talks about a ceasefire, and the closer the United States might be getting to, you know, towards some peaceful talks with Iran, he just lights up the whole region for right. his own personal, right. basically, ambition and and staying, you know, in, in full power. And he said that many times. I mean, Netanyahu doesn't want to see basically a Palestinian state because that's and he the doesn't want to see a. He doesn't want to see a ceasefire. He doesn't want to see the hostages release. He doesn't want any of that. And the other element, Jamal, which we need to keep in mind, this is a gift to Donald Trump if there's regional war. Because if there's regional war, it'll it, it'll put the Democrats and Kamala Harris and Biden into a very difficult situation because there's already fractures within the Democratic Party about their support for Israel. You know, and if there is a regional war, it will push Harris and Biden to supply more weapons, which will which will kill more Palestinians, which will engulf the region, and that will only support and enhance Donald Trump's chances of being the next president of the United States, which Benjamin Netanyahu wants Jamal. He does not want Harris. He does not well, want that, the- that, that. That's that's what he thinks. He thinks that this is kind of like the, these last uh, ninety days. Uh, is no man's land in uh, American diplomacy, and he can do whatever he... Because nothing will change. Right. Nothing will change. And prior to this, from day one, that actually shows the weakness of uh, President Biden from day one. The, the, from day one when he flew to uh, Tel Aviv to meet, to meet with Netanyahu and give him all the support and everything. And then he goes around and bites his hand. He doesn't listen to him. And they tell him, don't go into Rafah. What does he do? He goes into Rafa. Don't kill children. What does he do? Today, they bomb two schools. Two schools, as we're speaking. Uh, children are dying in two schools in Gaza. Yesterday, they bombed the hospital where refugees were hiding in the, in, in, in the backyard of a hospital. And so every day, he continues his, his slaughter. And then they go crying. He comes to Congress and say, we're under threat. Give us more money. Give us more weapons. We want to finish the job. And he has no respect to the pre- for the president of the United States. He has no respect to the vice p- president of the United States, who's who's uh, presumptive nominee for the presidency. And he's buying time, thinking that his buddy uh, Donald Trump is going to come and and save the day for him. And meanwhile, he can continue in his slaughter. I mean, that's what's it's a daily daily slaughter that's and happening Jamal, in Gaza. And nobody, nobody is holding uh, Israel and Netanyahu accountable. Yes, the ICJ is pursuing a genocide case. Yes, the ICJ is saying that occupation in the West Bank, Jerusalem are illegal under international law. But we see a lack of international uh, ability and international effort to forestall, stop, or contain the bloody criminality of Benjamin Netanyahu and the Israeli military. They're committing war crimes every single day. The genocide is occurring. The starvation of children is, is, continues unabated. And yet, what is the United States doing, Jamal? And what is the UK doing? And what will NATO do? Uh, they will send more support to Benjamin Netanyahu. And what this does, Jamal, is create the impossibility of any kind of peaceful solution. So uh, I think your analysis is exactly right. This is uh, part of his individual, you know, saving his political career for Netanyahu. But let's be clear, for the last 20 years, as long as Netanyahu has been in power and the far-right extremist governments, uh, whether Likud or Labour, they want to exterminate. They want to ethnically cleanse Palestinians. They want to, quote, as they say, finish the job. And their dream, their fantasy, is to destroy Beirut and Tehran. And I think they're well on their way, Jamal. Who, let me ask you, Jamal. Who's going to stop them? 
if Netanyahu does this? Well, definitely not the United States because but who it has else? failed so far. So I think, who else? I think, I think that'll be maybe up to a surprise. I think this is going to backfire. I don't think, I don't think uh, what they think about uh, Iran's firepower, they, ha- they are underestimating it. They're underestimating uh, Hezbollah's firepower. And, uh, of course, now nobody talks about the hostages, that they're going to be probably uh, killed in the process. And uh, Israel is going to also pay a price. Israel is going to pay a price. Israel has not learned its lesson uh, during the war on Lebanon, and they're trying to do the same thing. They haven't learned their lesson in the assassination. Remember, 20 years ago, they assassinated the founder and the spiritual leader of Hamas, Sheikh Ahmed Yassin. I mean, this is not the first time they assassinate him. Who came after him? Khalid Mish'al. Khalid Mish'al was a more hawkish figure than, than Sheikh uh, uh, Ahmed, Yassin. Uh, Ahmed Yassin. And so they think by assassinating, uh, you know, now Ismail Haniyeh, they're going to finish Hamas. They're just dreaming well, about that. But, but, but here's the other I- irony. And, and actually, there was an interesting article that came out uh, after the assassination of uh, Ismail Haniya. And the idea is that Israel wants to weaken Hamas, right, by these assassinations, Mohammed Deeds, Ismail Haniya, they're going after Sinwar. But here's the reality on the ground. This only strengthens Hamas's resolve. This only encourages more kinds of uh, activities that will not only support Hamas, but support this kind of resistance it's going to, as you say, backfire spectacularly. The short-term aim of whatever political benefit Benjamin Netanyahu gets from these assassinations is going to pale in comparison to the devastation that is going to be brought to the region and ultimately is going to cost the Israeli economy, the Israeli uh, civil society deeply. And It has, uh, already, it has already done that just... Without the support of the United States, Israel will not last one week. Israel's economy is in shambles. Just so you, all, all that you need is read about it. The airport, as we're speaking now, it has shut down. Flights are not going in and out of uh, Ben Gurion. They've lost tourism there. They've lost investors there. They're spending millions or billions of dollars on, 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 on Gaza, on a war they thought they can finish in one week. They have uh, called on the reserves. Those are the reserves. You know what they do? They work in the tech industry in Israel. They work in factories. They work in the banking industry. They're now at the front. Who's bailing them out? Your money, your taxpayers' money is bailing them out, and my money is bailing them out. Without it, they will not last one week. They, Benjamin Netanyahu has destroyed the economy of Israel, and, and then afterwards they're going to come again begging the Americans to bail them out. And that's what's going to happen. That was the, the that was the, the the his trip to Washington D.C. the precursor for that for just opening the hands the next time saying we need more billions we need more billions of of taxpayers' money. And that's why and that's why Jamal that's all going to happen. Well, that that's going to put pressure on Biden and Harris to do all that thing to give more money to send more bombs, which will ultimately undermine the Democrats' ability to defeat Donald Trump. That's how it's all connected. Um, so I think we're headed in the next four months, you know, as we, as we you know, kind of get to the elections and, and what's happening. Uh, Palestinians, uh, not just in Gaza, but in the West Bank and Jerusalem, are going to pay a dear price for the lack of U.S. ability and the world community to hold this war criminal, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu, to hold him accountable and to hold this criminal enterprise that we call Israel to hold the entire enterprise uh, accountable. And, you know, Jamal, we'll see what happens with the election when Harris and Biden send more bombs in, in to, to the Israeli military when the whole region is on fire. Let's see how that works in the election. You've been listening to Arab Talk on KPO San Francisco 89.5 FM. Go to our website, arabtalkradio.com, to download the latest shows, and we'll talk to you next week. See you next week. Thank you.